Okay, guys. Well, according to this article on Universe Today, which was published on the 27th of July, we are apparently about to see a very spectacular alignment between Aldebaran and the Moon. Now, thanks to Alan for bringing my attention to this because I actually see these alignments as something very significant and especially alignments as spectacular as this one because as we know when we study hermetics and we look to the law of cause and effect, we know that nothing is random and that chance is but a name for a law not recognized. And so all of these alignments are very important when we're gauging what part of the cycle we are at, especially as we are in the last degrees of the Iron Age, moving towards the end of the great year. And so you can bet that the Vatican are paying close attention to this alignment and they have information locked up in that library that allows them to understand what part of the cycle we're actually in because these are the indicators that ancient man used so he knew at what part of the great year we were actually situated in and so we know that the Vatican has stolen all of this information and what they couldn't steal they burned and it is now locked up in their library and this is also why they have one of the best observatories on the planet if not the best and this is because they know how important these alignments are. Now this alignment is going to be seen by the southern and eastern states in the United States and this is going to be something that they expect will be quite spectacular because what will happen is Aldebaran is going to graze just part of the moon on the edge and due to this it's saying that it's going to flash in and out of view as the peaks and cliffs momentarily block it from sight. And observers along the western section of the Grays Line where the event takes place in fairly dark sky can watch the star blink in and out of view without optical aid when it reaches the dark part of the lunar disk. So it is going to be something that looks quite spectacular if you are in any of these southern and eastern states where the occultation is going to be visible. Now, Aldebaran is a very important star. It's actually the eye of Taurus. And if we look to the information about Taurus, we can see that in the Greek mythology, Taurus was actually connected with Zeus. Now Taurus is actually situated right beside Orion and this mythology was all created because the ancients knew that even though as we fall into the lower stages of the cycle we could expect that the knowledge would be corrupted, that nothing could corrupt the stars, that they would always remain the same. They can corrupt the calendar, they can corrupt the information and they can corrupt the interpretations of the scriptures but they can't actually corrupt the constellations and what the ancients sought to do was leave as many different mythologies about the constellations as they could but all of these mythologies when you bring them together have a common theme and this theme is all about the divine man and the cycle in which the divine man exists in, in which he illuminates in the higher ages and then he loses the illumination as we descend down the cycle during the great year and we now find ourselves in the Iron Age and we now also find that the illumination within the divine element within mankind has now disappeared and the gods resemble mortals and so we do not know who the gods are amongst mankind because they are as of 
the mortals in appearance. And this is what all of the mythology tells us when we understand the symbolism behind all of the stories and the scriptures and all of the other esoteric information that was left to us so that we could decode all of these mythologies and all of this symbolism. And part of it is with the astrology. The astrology is very important when it comes to understanding mythology and understanding scripture because it is all connected. And so we can see in the Greek mythology that Taurus was identified with Zeus who assumed the form of a magnificent white bull to abduct Europa, a legendary Phoenician princess. In illustrations of Greek mythology, only the front portion of this constellation are depicted. This was sometimes explained as Taurus being partly submerged as he carried Europa out to sea. Now, anyone studying this esoteric information knows that the ocean and all of the marine symbolism is connected to the ether because the ether acts and behaves like the ocean and it moves in and it moves out. And when it moves in, we are at a stage within the great year where the presence of God is once again felt on the physical plane and the gods and goddesses illuminate. So the divine nature within mankind is once again apparent because we only know God through the extensions of our creator, which are his children which are also known as the Olympians, the tribes of Israel, and all of the gods and goddesses that are apparent in all of the mythology across culture. So when we understand what this means, we understand that it is very important to identify that we move in and out of this cycle constantly. And this is what the ocean symbolism is actually representing. And so it is not surprising to see Europa was submerged and carried out to sea with Taurus, the bull, who is representing Zeus. Now, it's also another way to look at the bull is that this is the divine portion within mankind within the gods but all of mankind have this divine portion within them it's just to different degrees and we can also see this in the symbolism of the rabbit we can see this in the symbolism of the lamb with jesus the lamb is symbolizing the divine portion within the gods and goddesses within jesus who is the symbol for the first born son of the creator but also can be transferred to the firstborn demigod as well so this is why you see Jesus in the form of a child and Jesus on the cross because we're actually looking at the firstborn God and also the firstborn demigod so Jesus is just a symbol what's happened is the Vatican have taken a symbol and they have personified this to create a persona and give the very ignorant flock something to worship, an idol. And they are in error because this is just a symbol. And we can see the symbol of Jesus as Thor. Now, this is also why you see in Islam that they do not draw pictures of Muhammad. And this is because they wanted to avoid falling into idol worship because Anyone who understands the scripture understands that falling into idol worship is something that you do in ignorance and that will not be rewarded when the time comes to sort the wheat from the chaff because you want to be a conscious partaker in the creation of our heavenly father. And so we need to understand that when we fall into idol worship, we are not actually being conscious partakers within his experience. So we want to understand that this is where the religions have been taken control of, all of the religions have been taken control of to keep us 
separated from the divinity within us and from our understanding of the creator and of ourselves. Once we understand that, we can stop being fearful of looking outside of the Bible or the scriptures that the priests tell us we can only look at, we can only accept because we shouldn't be afraid of knowledge. And as I am showing, we actually need all of this information so that we can have an understanding for the full picture. Otherwise, we're only going to get fragments and we're never really going to have an understanding for any of this. And so we can see that Aldebaran is a very important star because it is the eye of Taurus. Now, the other interesting information I found about Aldebaran is it's one of the royal stars of the Persians. Now, this is interesting because when we look at the other stars, because there are four royal stars, we see that we have Regulus, Antares, and Formalhort. Now, Aldebaran is Taurus, and Taurus represents the bull within the four creatures. So if we look to the symbolism once again, and we understand the four creatures, we know that they're representing the divine nature within mankind. They're also representing the four races within the divine race. So we've got Aldebaran and Taurus representing the tribe of Ephraim, which is the bull. Then we have Regulus, which is representing Leo and the tribe of Judah, which is the black race. Ephraim and the bull is actually representing the yellow race. Scorpius is actually a symbol that can also translate to the eagle. And in astrology, you'll often see this interchanged with Scorpio and eagle. Now, the eagle in the four creatures is actually representing the tribe of Dan and the white race. And then we have Formahot, which is Pisces. And when we look into the symbol of Pisces, we can see that this is associated with the divine man and woman or the gods and goddesses because it shows us here in the Greek mythology once again that it was associated with Aphrodite and Eros. And Pisces also sits at the feet of Aquarius. And if we look at the symbolism for Aquarius, we see that we can find Aquarius in the symbolism of Pisces here as well when we're looking at Jofra Broschhardt's artwork. And his artwork is absolutely on point when it comes to the symbolism of astrology. And he was commissioned to do these 12 pieces. And there is so much information in all of his artwork that connects to the esoteric knowledge that we can see. Again, he shows that we see the man here with the fish. And then we see the same man here holding the urn of ether, symbolizing the ether. And we also see the skull here because these are the times where we move towards the end of the cycle and those souls that do not carry the light will not move through into a new age with the divine. Now the fish are also representing the divine man and woman. And it's also representing the cycle of the higher and lower ages because at this time of the cycle when we're in the Iron Age, then the gods and goddesses are not known to us because they are resembling mortals. They no longer have any illumination and the divine nature within mankind is not apparent. It is not visually apparent. But when we move back into the higher ages and the ether moves back in, we then once again feel the presence of the creator on the physical plane and this is shown through his extensions which are his children also known as the gods and goddesses. This is what all of the information is about. We also see this in this information here about the symbols associated to Taurus this is also why we see the Hindu represent 
the symbolism of the bull in their mythology and it is something that is very sacred to them and this is the divine portion within the gods and goddesses and within mortals because all mankind have the divinity within them the divine portion is within mankind it's just to different degrees and this is why the gods and goddesses are divine they have this divine portion to a different degree than mortals and so we can see the twins are also represented here because Gemini is to the east of the constellation Taurus we see Cupid here because Cupid is the demigod and so again we see this represented with Taurus and Taurus being associated to the creator and right next to the constellation Orion now again I just wanted to show the symbolism of the bull in relation to the divine nature within mankind and the divine nature within the gods because as they move down the ages and descend through the cycle it is more a case of man having to fight with himself with his own nature and this is why we see often in the symbolism the controlling of the bull as in Mithra trying to control and subdue the bull and also we see this in the symbol uh, the symbolism with the serpent where man is trying to control that lower base nature and in the Iron Age when man has forgotten himself this is quite difficult to do and this is also where we see the symbolism of the fallen angel this is the divine man who has fallen into unconsciousness in the lower parts of the cycle now I just want to bring you this paragraph from the Corpus Hermetica in regards to the waning light the ether moving out of the cycle we also see this in the principle of rhythm in hermetics and this is the cycle that we're in where everything moves in and out just like the ocean and the tides just like the waxing and waning of the moon we see the ether moves in and the light is carried on the ether the Christ consciousness is carried on the ether or the Holy Spirit as it's also shown in the Christian mythology is shown on the ether moving in and this brings back the divine nature within mankind and this also brings back the presence of the Creator on the physical plane through his extensions which are the gods and goddesses his children the tribes of Israel the Olympians you know all of the gods and goddesses that we see in all of the mythology in every culture is all representing the divine extensions of our Creator and we know the Creator through his children this is why it says to get to God you must go through Jesus it doesn't mean you have to pray to an icon that they have created it means you have to understand that everything that we understand about the Creator we can only reach through his extensions because the Creator can never be manifest on the physical plane other than through his extensions through his children that is what that symbolism means and unfortunately Christians just do not understand that and they fall into error because they want to personify the symbol of Jesus and create something of an icon instead of just seeing it as a symbol that represents the firstborn son of the creator but also the firstborn demigod which is why we see Jesus in the symbolism of the child with Mary but again unless you understand the symbolism correctly then this is something that many Christians just do not understand unfortunately so it goes on to say the intellect O Tat is drawn from the very substance of God in men this intellect is God and so some men are gods and their humanity is near the divine when man is not guided by intellect he falls below himself into an animal state 
And this is what we're seeing here in this symbolism. All men are subject to destiny. This is the law of cause and effect. But those in possession of the Logos, which commands the intellect from within, are not under it in the same manner as others. The Logos is also another symbol for the divine portion within mankind. The divine portion within the gods. And so this is why the gods are different to mortals because their destinies are not the same. However, as it shows here, that mortals have the ability to also rise themselves, raise themselves up to the level of gods. It goes on to say that God's two gifts to man of intellect and the Logos have the same value as immortality. If man makes right use of these, he differs in no way to the immortals. And so if he walks the correct path and he uses his intellect in the correct way and he doesn't fall into error, then he is just as an immortal and he will move through into a new age, a new great year with the gods and goddesses. Now, this one from Plato also goes on to say, for many generations, as long as the divine nature lasted in them, they were obedient to the laws and well affection towards the God whose seed they were, for they possessed true and in every way great spirits. However, the Atlanteans, which is also another symbolist, uh, sim symbol for the divine within mankind, they're known as the Atlanteans um, as well, they became corrupt when the divine portion began to fade away. And this is happening because they are moving down the cycle and becomes diluted too often and too much with mortals a mixture. So as you can understand, the divine always remain 144 tribes in number. Okay, 288 are the divine individuals and then they're 144 tribes. Now that never changes. However, as we move down the cycle, the mortals are basically populating the planet. And so the nature within the mankind becomes diluted. It becomes the mortals begin to take possession of the kingdom. And now we're in the Iron Age and it is completely in control of the mortals who really are only caretakers while the gods and goddesses are no longer able to be here within, you know, um, the kingdom as they once were in the Golden Age. They've handed this over to the mortals. However, the mortals are also no longer understanding their divine nature and we can see that we aren't in a very good place. But this is all part of the cycle. And these are where our tests come in. And so it goes on to say the human nature got the upper hand and then being unable to bear their fortune behaved unseemly and to those who had an eye to see grew visibly debased and the eye is God, the creator who is always watching and he sees everything. And so again we can see that this is where the symbolism of the fallen angel and the Nephilim all is showing this divine nature within mankind, the gods moving into an unconscious time of the cycle and not remembering who they were. So that's pretty much all I wanted to bring you. I just did want to show you all of this symbolism in relation to Aldebaran because it is a very important star of a very important constellation and so when we're seeing these types of alignments it's definitely something I think that we should be paying attention to. So all of you people living in these areas are very lucky. You are going to see something quite spectacular. So I hope that you get nice clear skies and you're able to see this alignment and as I said this is something very very significant. So Let's just hope that we do see something quite special when this occurs. And again, thank you to Alan for bringing this to my attention.
Well, I'll leave it here and I'll post everything underneath and you can check that out in more detail. And as always, peace out.